on July 10th at noon, we will be having a Tannenberg organ concert series uh, or one of one of our uh, concerts, which is always a popular uh, attraction in the summer months. So please feel free to join us online for that. It will be live streamed. We will also have a limited number of slots available to, to get free tickets. That's something that you will need to book in advance through our website or by contacting us directly. Obviously, we're all going to have to operate a little bit differently from now on. Uh, we'll have to be limiting uh, the number of people in certain areas at certain times to maintain proper social distancing. So there will be a limited amount of in-person tickets for that organ concert series. Uh, which is, like I said, it's on uh, July 10th at noon. Uh, July 11th is the second Saturday in the month of July, and at 10.30 we'll be having a lecture, which, again, there will be a limited amount of seats available for that lecture, which will take place in our meeting hall, but it will also be live streamed. So you can certainly participate virtually, and we encourage people to do that, definitely. Uh, the lecture will be given by Mindy Crawford, who is uh, involved in preserving uh, Pennsylvania uh, historic buildings, and she will be discussing travel and attractions in and around the city of York. So please feel free to join us for that. We'll also be having a second Saturday event for families, uh, and details will follow on that event. So I'm going to move on to the third slide for tonight. Uh, <clears throat> and then I'm going to turn the floor over to Scott Mingus, who's going to tell us uh, a few of the things we need to know about tonight's speaker. So uh, please, please uh, take a look at some of the information that I have up here um, in case, in case any of our speakers tonight need an introduction, which I don't think they do, but, uh, but they deserve one. So um, our uh, panelist tonight, like I said, will be Scott Mingus. Uh, he'll be introducing Jim McClure. Uh, I will also be here and uh, director, library director Nicole Smith is also in the background. She's, uh, she's running the event from behind the scenes tonight and we will be taking your questions as Jim is giving his talk. So uh, please feel free to actively participate if you have any questions about things uh, in tonight's lecture. Please send them to our chat feature which we will be monitoring and um, by all means, we will try to get those to our speaker tonight. So I think at that point, without further ado, I'd like to turn things over to Scott, who's going to uh, introduce our speaker. Thanks. Uh, I moved to uh, Pennsylvania in 2001 from Cleveland, Ohio. And in the first three or four years uh, after I moved here, one of the first people from the history community that I really met and started to admire was Jim McClure. I've uh, been pleased over the last, you know, 17, 18 years that I've known Jim to call him a good friend. Uh, in many ways, he's been my mentor and my inspiration for a lot of the work that I've did. Uh, you can see on the screen, of course, you know, Jim's uh, just mo most notable, probably to most people in York County, uh, for as many years as the editor of the York Daily Record newspaper. Uh, Jim's pretty modest. Uh, he's won a lot of awards, including a very recent one from the York County Bar Association. Uh, but Jim is... Uh, you know, extremely talented uh, as he has been uh, a host of numerous uh, events over the years. He's now hosted the uh, Retro York page, which I think Jim at last count has probably closing on 9,000 or so uh, people that are members there, making it one of the largest uh, Facebook groups that I know of, at least for any community of our size. So uh, Jim's gonna talk tonight to us and uh, I'm proud to introduce my good friend and co-author uh, and tonight's speaker, Jim McClure. Jim, you need to unmute. Thanks very much, uh, Scott, for that, that great introduction. Scott and I are working on a, we collaborated on two books and we're gonna take uh, those two books and combine them into a, a third book with a lot of new material. I, I think it's gonna be what, 300 pages, Scott, something like that on your County and the Civil War. Our Civil War Voices Project uh, is, um, you know, we're going to uh, kind of, uh, put that on steroids uh, here before the end of the year. So uh, thank you very much for the introduction. Thanks uh, to Adam and Nicole for, for um, you know, uh, orchestrating this whole thing. Uh, I, I'm gonna try to screen, uh, share my screen. 
uh, now and get on with this. Uh, let me try that again. I'm assuming everybody can see that now. So, yes. Uh, so, some quick points about tonight. Uh, I'm not going. I've, I've presented at other roundtables here in New York. I'm trying not to duplicate that material. I've done uh, work on uh, a presentation on Chief Burgess, David Small, who I did my master's uh, work on, uh, in part, my thesis around David Small. And I appreciate that roundtable for uh, hosting me on that evening. And uh, Scott and I have done Underground Railroad recently. And, uh, and then inevitably, the Surrender of York comes out into the discussion. I'm not going to talk as much about this friend or tonight or about these other topics. I want to talk about the impact on civilian life. And uh, so I'm going to try to talk about the impact of as many segments as I can. Uh, and I'll try to do this via quotes. You can see to my right, uh, there's, I, I have a lot of quotes in this presentation. So we'll be talking about what people actually said or what authors like Scott have said about uh, some of the people that we're talking about. If I miss stuff uh, and you have questions, I'm going to, uh, as, as Adam said, I'm going to uh, stop a couple of times and, and answer those questions as we go. I think that's a better moment. And the kind of a, a, the last comment before I plunge in is, I, I, thought, I thought about uh, subtitling this, uh, you think uh, uh, America in your county is divided now. Well, but there, there are many good moments uh, about uh, this terrible war. Uh, the Civil War to ponder. Uh, it was a terribly divided time. And uh, so I think, you know, where we are as a nation today, we might be able to connect with it, maybe long from, and realize that in terms of the Civil War, in terms of your county, we, we, made, we, we made it out the other side. And uh, so there may be some encouragement here too. I'm gonna go over these, you'll see there's a lot of slides. I'm gonna go over them very quickly. And, uh, and these are some of the, uh, there's 10 major uh, impactful, disruptive, or memorable Civil War events in your county. In your county. I'm going to just go the, over these as bullet points. Um, and uh, we're starting with the, uh, the camp, camp Scott and the fact that we hosted a major uh, training camp early in the war. It was the Old New York Fairgrounds at the southeast of King and Queen Streets. And uh, so, you know, the community got behind that camp and uh, provided supplies and food and so forth. There's t literally tens of thousands of soldiers who were there green when they came in and uh, better trained when they left. We had early responders as we have had in several wars. York Rifles were an early responder, went down and worked on, uh, you know, guarding the lines down in Maryland, uh, north of Baltimore. We had a major military hospital. Scott's written a lot. Scott Mingus has written a lot about this. And uh, it was major, 14,000 soldiers in blue from 62 to 65, about 200 died. Community again came out in support of that as well. The Battle of Wrightsville was, um, uh, you, could, you might call it a, a skirmish or some other term besides battle. Uh, it, it, was, it was a major event in a small town. And the major thing was that the Confederates got that far but couldn't get across because the Union Army burned the bridge uh, before they could get across. If they would have gone across, they would have had a, a path to Harrisburg. Uh, battle of, of Hanover is a, uh, something we should make note of. That was a cavalry battle uh, on June 30th after uh, some of the activities in New York, the city of New York. And this substantially slowed down Jeb Stewart and his cavalry from jo uh, joining uh, Lee's main army. And so it had a, a, a tactical and uh, strategic importance. There's a lot of spotlight on women. We'll talk about that going forward here. Uh, the nurses and other medical workers uh, from York did travel to Gettysburg and worked uh, after the Battle of Gettysburg, but also they, they worked in the uh, military hospital here in New York. And, and this show, uh, sh this, this, the spotlight was shown in York areas and women's uh, in terms of their community service. They really squarely came into the public square in the, in the Civil War. Uh, there's a big cost of war. Uh, there was more than 
uh, 11,000 Confederate soldiers who were occupying York uh, in one part of York or another. And one estimate has a, a thousand horses uh, left here in the hands of the Confederates. And uh, that would be equivalent to a thousand tractors today, a two mile long parade of horses if, I'm, if my math is correct. So a big loss of, uh, in an agriculture community to lose horses, many other things as well, not just horses, but that is, uh, there was, that is, a, that is a key point. It, you know, a major disruption of families, we'll talk about that. Uh, the Children's Home of New York went up as a result of the fact there were so many orphans of Civil War soldiers uh, and families that were, that were disrupted. Um, we also had, uh, you know, of course, Abraham Lincoln passed through here on a way to deliver his speech in Gettysburg. He went through Hanover Junction in Hanover. And so we, we, we observe that, we know that, we interpret that, major point. And then th those nine points are often subsumed by this point. And uh, this is a point, but it's a, a, a point that we need to, to remember and we need to keep talking about. And that is that um, the, the, uh, York was different than many other towns in that the town's father surrendered the town. Not just that we surrendered the town, other towns did that, but we went out and met the Confederates out in farmers uh, past where the York airport is today. And so that, that uh, decision was uh, kind of, and as we'll talk about here tonight uh, a little bit more, it really did make a difference in the way we see ourselves today in New York, that decision to surrender. So those are 10 points. I uh, just want to talk about the human tool and thank uh, Dennis Brandt for, for these numbers. I, I, these numbers are documented numbers, they're good numbers. Uh, you, would, you might think that uh, with uh, 600 dead, we'd have more than 700 wounded, but what we're trying to do is document uh, and not just guess. Uh, but the thing I, I think this is telling, the thing that I uh, pull from this, again, if my math is correct, is that, um, you know, when you take those three captured, uh, wounded, and dead, uh, take those three casualty numbers, and uh, that's about 2.5% two, of the population of the day, or it's equal to 11,000 people today. So let that sink in as to what a disruption, the way the war affected your county. You know, you can see in World War II, we lost 600, uh, uh, we lost 571. Um, but the population was more than the, the disruption factor, 11,000 people out of your county today. If, 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 if um, you know, so that, that's, a, that's a major, major impact if you extrapolate it out, um, you know, as to what the impact would be today. Okay, uh, we're not going to, uh, cover this in detail. This is uh, really the way in late June 1863, we're coming about on the anniversary. Uh, the Confederates entered York County. They camped uh, at, uh, in, well, Gordon Camp, John B. Gordon Camp uh, at the Farmers, and that's where the surrender took place. Basically, the Confederates came, um, you know, this is Yule's Corps, and it was divided into, um, you know, the division that we care about is uh, Juba Early's division. Jubal's earliest division came in three columns, one down through Hanover, that was a cavalry column, one along what's now Route 30, the Lincoln Highway, that was John B. Gordon's column, and then Early himself accompanied two other brigades uh, through the uh, Big Mound area and Admire area up to Weigelstown, and all of them converged in New York after um, the town's fathers surrendered the day before to uh, Gordon out at uh, Farmers. Gordon's brigade then went on to Wrightsville where we talked about the, um, he was stopped when the bridge burned. He countermarched to York and the entire outfit, the entire division countermarched whenever there was, it was obvious that a battle was brewing in Gettysburg. So here I think is 43 hours in, in York. They occupied the, uh, the borough of York in those days for, uh, for about 43 hours, about two days. Okay, so I want to show uh, by show, talking about two men here about what was going on in your county at that time. It was divided, as I said. Uh, it was it was a disrupt a time that was disrupted. Families were disrupted. We have two David Smalls. We have David Small and we have David E. Small. So I'm going to unpack these for a second. They are they are two different individuals uh, and uh, same extended family, but two different individuals. 
Uh, David Small, who was Chief Burgess, who was also owner of the Gazette, uh, he was Chief Burgess for nine terms. He was a Democrat. And uh, he actually, the two David Smalls ran against each other in 1867, and David Small, the Democrat, won in 1867. So a small versus small. So his, uh, his newspaper's politics and his politics uh, really followed the Copperhead or Peace Democrat position, union as it was, the Constitution as it is, and, and the Negroes where they are. So they were obviously weren't abolitionists. They, they would claim, they would say that they weren't pro-slavery because we didn't have slaveries in New York, slaves in New York, or enslaved people in New York. We hadn't had any for 20 years or, or longer. Uh, so it, we didn't see that slavery was really our problem, and we'll see, if anything, it was going to be inconvenienced if the slaves, enslaved people were manumitted. So that was, uh, that was kind of the mantra. This is the majority position in New York County at the time. It was kind of a middle ground between the abolitionists and the, and the pro-slavery folks. Then we had David Ettersmall, who is very, you know, who is very uh, is Republican. Uh, he was industrialist, uh, and, and and also he lost his arm in an industrial accident uh, before the war, which made it all the more interesting. Think about his position compared to David Small, the Democrat's position. He said, "If I can bring down a partridge with a gun, I certainly can shoot well enough to go to the defense of my country." You know, he was eager. As, a, as opposed to someone who's kicking and screaming into the war as the peace Democrats were. You know, here he is, he's ready to go into war. You know, some people associate him with the Brownstone House, which is uh, uh, Martin Library's property beside, uh, you know, on, on East Market Street. So we have two David Smalls, vastly different people, but this, the two David Smalls do illustrate your county in, the, in that day. So, you know, here we, we have, uh, I'll just talk a little more about them. Uh, they, the two Davis Smalls, both, uh, they show how even one family can be divided between the Dem and Republicans. And that, that happened then. It was brother against brother in, in your county, politically. Uh, David D's comment about fighting shows his support for his country. Davis Smalls' copyright position shows his support for, uh, for his country, the way he saw it. And uh, so watch for this. With the copyright position, the dominant view in the county, your county could not muster a firm resolve to oppose the invading foreign power in 1863, the Confederate Army of Robert E. Lee. You know, for some, they were friends and relatives and political allies. So when the Confederates came marching here in 1863, some people in New York considered them as family coming for a call, you know, and uh, it was obviously much more than that. So here, I want to show these real quickly. This, these are the, uh, the views of the dominant party, the Democrat Party, uh, in, or the Peace Democrat Party in York County. And these are a lot of long quotes, and so uh, bear with me. But I think it, it's interesting just to understand where we were uh, at, in, that, in that time frame. You know, here's the York Democratic Press, which was the second Democratic paper, the York Gazette being the dominant Democratic paper, which had pretty much the same view. 63, 60 uh, free uh, Negroes from North Carolina bound north, passed through Maryland the other day, caused the Southern secession excitement. We may expect hundreds of thousands of such visitors before long. Let uh, our abolitionist philanthropists make their arrangements accordingly. Shall the poor Negro, unless he be a fugitive slave, be allowed to starve? So he's basically saying, yeah, if, if, they, if, if uh, the enslaved people come here, freedmen come here, well, we, you know, the people that support that, better open up their wallets to help support them, as if they wouldn't work. As it, but if they did work, the other side, the right side of, of the uh, screen, says if they do work, then they're going to replace uh, the white man's liberty and earn bread for his starving family. So we, people in New York County saw it as, uh, you know, as a dilemma, in a way, the, the freedmen, uh, if, 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 if slaves were freed. You know, it, it would, how are we going to support them on one hand, and they'll take our jobs on the other? You know, so that, those are the, you can see that's the dominant view in York County at, at the time. I, I think this is interesting. June Burke Lloyd, uh, who I think many folks know, wrote in Faith and Family. These are, I'm going to read these because this really shows, this is the big picture impact of the Civil War. This, gets, this just talks about the, what the Civil War did to the fabric of, of York County. The American Civil War, which came home to Pennsylvania Germans of York County in the summer of 1863, had a substantial impact. Pennsylvania German men were uprooted from their familiar communities. Even those who escaped battle saw other places and met Americans different from themselves. 
they were no longer Germans who could get along sleeping, uh, uh, speaking Dutch. They were Americans and their lives could depend on the ability to communicate with fellow soldiers. And then further, the world that emerged from the traumatic conflict of the Civil War could never be the same. The need for war materials that accelerated the growth of northern industry. Young men left their small communities to work alongside others in factories. York County children spoke English, learned in the public schools. Uh, only the old folks spoke Dutch. The young people were Americans. They dressed, spoke, and worked alike. The Civil War was transformative in York County in many respects. Um, it, was, it, it, it was disruptive, but York County was a different county after the war, you might say. So there's... Um, uh, Jean Burke Lloyd's uh, assessment of the uh, of the Civil War, and we'll, uh, I'll just go over this, and then we'll stop and see if there's any questions. Um, you know, the, the, this is something that we really have to. Uh, this, you know, not everything is tied to geography, but clearly our position on the Mason-Dixon line has a lot to do with the way we are then and now. Uh, the war cut cultural, social, and economic ties with the South, which is one of the things that we didn't really like. Uh, Mark Snell, who's a historian from York, uh, taught at Shepherd College for many years, you know, made this famous statement as master's thesis. The railroad tied York County's economic interests to the South before, uh, before the war, and for this reason, many county inhabitants were reluctant to voice any opposition to slavery in the Southern way of life. But York counties had more in common with the South than just a pension for Southern money. They also showed, share many of the same values and political ideas of their Southern neighbors. So that's kind of setting the scene. And uh, Adam, are there any questions um, at, at this moment? Actually, we do have a question, which I think that you're going to get to in your presentation, but you might want to um, try to you know, move forward to that. But there's a question about, uh, well, I'll just read the question. <laughs> it's easier that way. Uh, I had the impression that York County also generally elected Democrats, Kofroth, Bailey, Glossbrenner to the House of Representatives before and during the Civil War. Did Lincoln carry York County in either or both of the 1860 and 1864 elections? Yeah, we will get to that. Uh, we'll get to that briefly. But basically, Lincoln did not. He did not carry York County in either election. In fact, he lost ground in 1864 versus 1860. Uh, uh, Dem uh, York County supported Democrat um, presidents from the early 1800s to the early 1900s, a full century, and uh, and that that included. Uh, so we were we were we voted against uh, Abraham Lincoln both elections. The, that's why I can say, you know, with confidence here that the majority view in York County was Peace Democrat, anti-Lincoln. Yeah, Jim, if I could just interject for one second, 1862, the War Democrat Joseph Bailey beat Adam Glassbrenner, who was the Peace Democrat. And then two years later in 64, uh, Glassbrenner destroyed him uh, and got the seat back. So there was, you know, not a Republican elected, but you certainly had a war Democrat, at least when one of the elections here uh, before the uh, Peace Democrats again reasserted power. Yeah, and that's an interesting point. What, what normally happens in war, and this is something that we, we need to keep in mind just even going forward, is often there's a lot of enthusiasm early in the war. And then as the, as the war wears on, we lose that enthusiasm as the bodies come back and names of those deceased are in the newspaper. And we, we, lose, and we lose enthusiasm. And that went with uh, some of the Middle East wars earlier this uh, century, 21st century. It happens in most any war. So the, the often a draft is then instituted. And that is, a, that is a really a tough thing for many residents. They'll, they'll volunteer. But if they're drafted, then that, that, that's, a, that's a difficult moment for many families. So, okay, I'll go ahead and, uh, you know, and if there's other, we'll get more back at that in a few minutes. Uh, I, I mentioned earlier that women squarely enter the public square. And, uh, you know, Mark Snell, the women of York also pitched in with enthusiasm. Those women organized other women who in turn went about their tasks of collecting and making stockings shirts, bandages, and other articles for the troops. So we had this, we, we love the warrior. You're seeing that, we love the warrior. We had military hospital here, we had that uh, Camp Scott here, the training camp here, at least for uh, some period of time we had Camp Scott here. And we had the community getting behind that. But then we have the war, what the war meant. And so this is why these divisions take place is 
we, we love the warrior, but we're hating the war. We didn't like Lincoln because he meant war. Here we have the York Democratic Press again. It's uh, the war's uh, present results are in discord, confusion, or ruins of trade, the closing of workshops, the uh, production of want, institution, poverty, and all that. And this was in April 1861, right after the war began. You know, imagine what, what uh, the view was up towards the war as the war went on in York County, which we never supported at the beginning. So it's kind of like, we told you so, this war is going to be bad, we told you so, and uh, we voted that way as well. Okay, the churches were uh, divided. Uh, again, these are all impacts. This is how the war impacted the civilians in, in York County. Uh, this is just one incident among many. Uh, you know, and here we have the Presbyterian pastor in town who supported this book salesman, uh, you know, kind of gave him his endorsement and then took it back when he found out the, the book salesman had Southern sympathies. So the two and a union officer uh, squared off with the salesman in the middle of the street and the, and the pastor found himself in jail, got out in time to preach, making no reference to the altercation that had taken place just a short time before. So, it, you know, it, the churches were, uh, you know, the, it had been difficult to be a pastor in those days preaching about the war because some of your congregation would have been anti-war, some would have been for the war. It would have been a difficult position uh, here in New York County. It wasn't like if you're in New Hampshire and, you know, went, where it was mainly pro-war and maybe even abolitions. It wasn't be like where it was in, um, you know, in, in South Carolina, you know, where, but, would, but I, I would just say, you know, you need to preach the truth, uh, wh whatever your congregation is. And some did, and some of them got in trouble as a result. So a uh, terribly difficult time. Uh, you know, this is really something that I, I've looked at this more recently. This is William B. Franklin, who's a native son, who was a, a, a ranking general in the Union Army. And he was here right before the Confederate invasion in 1863. And he said, his invasion will destroy your property, meaning the Confederates. His invasion will destroy your property, will degrade you and your country, and if allowed to proceed without strenuous resistance, will make you objects of contempt and scorn to your own country in the remainder of the civilized war. So he, he said before the Confederate invasion, you, you got to fight. You got to be ready. You got to be prepared. And uh, James Latimer said at about that same time he was a lawyer. With all this, there's not the least excitement here. No one is alarmed. Everyone seems as different as if there were no rebels within a thousand miles. Of course, the rebels were coming their way. And, uh, you know, this was the malaise that was in New York right in, in June, 1863. And then we have, uh, you know, Cassandra Small saying about A.B. Farquhar, who's a young industrialist in town, one young man, uh, Mr. Farquhar started off with his own responsibility without telling anybody. And that was the case when the Confederates were on our front porch. You know, he, he went on his own and kind of uh, brokered a preliminary deal, kind of forced the hand of the town. Uh, and, uh, you know, so, you know, there was no plan. So what, did he, what happened? He freelanced and, uh, and, and basically brought, brought the Confederates in unimpeded. Um, and we'll talk about that a little bit more later. Uh, so when you don't have a plan, you freelance. And we didn't have a plan here in New York. Another impact, invading Confederates terrorized civilians in the countryside. This is a well-known quote involving Rollins from out in, uh, Ellen Rowland from out in the Amesville area. Where's your husband? Why are you leaving home? The Confederates asked, asked her. You know, she was walking with her, uh, with her children to try to get into Amesville. Do you know we will burn uh, down your home sooner if it were unoccupied than if you lived there? So it, it's, it's really, we have a, a, another nation coming in and we're making threats of violence against civilians. You know, uh, it's hard to really capsulize the terror that was uh, around the county uh, after when the Confederates, particularly when the Confederates were in our county. And well, this is one way to uh, capsulize it. This is Mary Fisher, who was the wife of uh, Judge uh, Robert Fisher, an accomplished woman, a nurse at the military hospital, uh, one of the leaders in town. She said, we knew not how soon might come a signal to unleash the dogs of war in our midst and give your homes a prey to the invader. They didn't know what the Confederates were going to do 
as they were around town. She wrote this as the, the Confederates were picketing her house, in front of her house. They had sentries out in front of her house. So, you know, there's a great amount of fear when the Confederates got here. Now, what about the, the, the black population that was here whenever the Confederates came on, on knocking on our Western border? And uh, here's two evidences, two pieces of evidence. There's, there's others. Here, this is just a sign uh, in, um, in Mercersburg, Franklin County, which happened after a raid uh, in 1862, Jeff Stewart's raid in 1862. And you can see that last line there. During the Confederate campaign, the Confederates also took and it, it talks about some black families, some African-American families, and kept them in Richmond for months. It was well known that the Confederates would, uh, would, send, would capture freedmen and return them to the South. And so likely when the Confederates were here, the, uh, the black population moved across the river or at least were well hidden. I, I read the other day, that, uh, that after the Confederates left on that Tuesday, uh, uh, leaving on Monday earlier in that week, uh, you know, the town's father said, well, maybe we ought to put up ro you know, roadblocks and, and, and block the Gettysburg Pike and so we can impede in case the Confederates come back here, which was, they, was a fear. So uh, in one account I read, the, the black, some black laborers helped erect those impediments. So the, the blacks must have returned to home, to the town, or been hiding in places where they couldn't have been found. If they would have been found, it's likely that they could have been returned uh, to the South or brought to the South, even though they were free. And this is interesting. This is Cassandra Small, who was P.A. Small's daughter, who lived in what's now, what was Lafayette Club for years, and now it's the York College um, uh, Center for Commun Community Engagement. And just notice in the fine print here, the first we knew of it, meaning the Confederates uh, approaching York, was at tea time when, they, when we were all sitting quietly at the table. Papa, that's P.A. Small, knew nothing of all this as he was in the country until we sat down and Lad hadn't come. Uh, Lad and Mary had been staying here as all their servants had fled. So there's indication that the, uh, the the, the blacks that were tending to, that were part of the households of the PA and uh, small family had, were no longer there. They weren't going to stick around. Uh, you know, and then the Confederates did come in. We surrendered, the Confederates came in, and uh, you know, this is Cassandra Small. Just as the bells rang, the cry was heard, they are coming. Oh, Lissy, what did we feel like then? Humiliated, disgraced, men who, often, who don't often weep about then, just as General Franklin had said, you know, you'll, you, you know it'll, it'll, you'll lose your honor if you don't at least have a plan, you know, to offset no matter what the uh, number that you're facing. And it was neighbor versus neighbor. And, uh, Lee, uh, and Cassandra Small said, there will be a dividing line drawn here. Our next door neighbor, she wrote, has proved himself a secessionist. We all liked him and his family so much before. He entertained the officers, officers all the time. Oh, we have many such persons. And nobody speaks to them. So we have, after this, we, we have the town divided, the, the county divided between, you know, those, you know, who supported the Confederates were here and those who, who at least passively resisted the Confederates when they were here. Uh, Look just, at this. Is this, uh, is this surprising to people? I, I just, you know, this is the way... This is the way that lines were drawn in the Civil War. Adam? Uh, do you mind if I, I'm sorry, if I'm uh, breaking in, but we have a few questions accumulating. Uh, yes. Would you, mind, would you mind fielding those? Yes. Right now? Okay. Um, I'm not sure the order here because uh, they're on two different subjects that you covered, um, but uh, I think I'll start with the first one that is the most recent thing. Uh, before, you, before you started talking about uh, Cassandra, you're talking about the African-American population. Um, this question is from Scott Rosenau, who's very involved with the roundtable. And uh, he asks, did any of the black population use underground railroad safe houses as places to hide during the Confederate invasion? I, I've never seen uh, evidence of that. One might think that might have happened. You might think that the Quakers in the Northern Tier 
uh, which uh, might have uh, done that. Uh, but I, I've always just figured the common sense thing would be to cross the river and uh, have the river between you and the Confederates, as, as thousands of people did. I mean, that was common. Uh, and so why wouldn't, if you were a black person, why wouldn't you just cross the river? Uh, uh, and Scott Mingus might have a, heard, uh, might have another view on this, but I've never heard that happening. I've never seen documentation of that. Uh, Jim, uh, I, I would agree. In fact, to your point, there were 1,800 black people that crossed the toll bridge into Harrisburg. Uh, we don't know the number of people who went through York and crossed the bridge, toll bridge, of course, into Wrightsville, but it certainly had to be somewhere in that magnitude, you I know, mean, probably at least you know, hundreds and hundreds, if not up to a thousand. Uh, but yeah, having, you know, studied the Underground Railroad, there weren't that many safe houses. Keep in mind, there weren't that many safe houses left by 1863 because, right. you know, most of the Underground Railroad conductors, the Quakers, were long gone uh, as far as being pretty active. By then, you had Samuel Berry and William Goodrich and some of the Black community that were the Underground Railroad conductors in in the 1850s, the late 1850s, 1860s, so, and those guys probably left too. So I don't, that's why I, I tend to agree with you that they would not have used Underground Railroad safe houses because there just weren't that many by that point in time. Right. Um, if you don't mind, uh, there's one more question, and then I have a follow up question, which is something that I was just thinking of a few minutes ago. Uh, which you can certainly save to the end. Uh, but I am curious if, if both of you could, could get to that. But first um, question, um, going back to the very contentious issue of the surrender by Farquhar, et cetera, um, do you think they would have done to York what they did to Chambersburg, I'm supposing, if there had not been this attempt to reach out? Uh, no. At this point in the war, there wasn't total war in the in the way there was the next summer uh, of 1864. It was a different war then, and uh, at this point of the war, they th there wasn't that type of uh, a scorched earth going on uh, as a general rule. Also, the Confederates were under uh, Lee's uh, directive not to, you know, not to pillage, not to destroy property. So it, it just clearly wouldn't have happened. Now the town's fathers didn't know that Lee had ordered that, but uh, you know uh, it wasn't that type of war at that point. Um, and if I could ask my follow-up question, and you can you you can answer it now or just think about it. Um, but I, I was thinking about how uh, during the revolution, this is just kind of my comparison. During the revolution, um, when different regions of the country were generally loyalist in sentiment. Um, they stayed that way, but there was always this tendency that once the war shifted to their theater, a lot more people started to support the Patriots because they saw the British doing various things, uh, attacks on civilians or confiscating property or various other either real or imagined atrocities. Um, and this usually led to this sudden surge in Patriot sentiment. Uh, so shifting forward to York County in 1863, we know that the county voted even more overwhelmingly against Lincoln in 1864. Um, can we get into the heads of people and figure out, so, you know, we know that the Confederates were raiding and they were causing mayhem in 1863. Why did not, why did that not translate into some sort of shift in public opinion? Anyway, that's what's going through my head. <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I think if, if anything, uh, when the Confederates came here, again, we, it, it, it was a, my, I guess, a, I'll have to think about this through a little bit more, but, but what I, I think it is that we, that they, they brought war here and it made it all the more certain in our minds that we didn't like war and that we wanted peace. We were tired of war anyway, and then war came to our soil, and maybe it would come to our soil again, and can't we get out from under this, which we didn't believe in anyway. And we, so the, the Confederates coming here didn't uh, cause us to rally against them. If anything, it made us sicker of 
just tired, tired her. At that time, also, we were going deeper and deeper in recruiting or drafting uh, York County uh, soldiers, which, uh, you know, which, all, as I said earlier, really does, a, it does cause uh, a, a, a community to turn when they start losing younger and uh, different generations of, of soldiers uh, when they're drafted, when they don't go according to their own volition. So we were just, uh, I, I think it just worked the other way. It didn't cause us to rally. In the American Revolution, uh, I, I, you know, I've often heard uh, experts say, you know, we are a third, a third, a third. We are a third patriots, a third lo uh, loyalists, <laughs> and, and a third depends on which army was close to us at the time. Right. Right. So, um, so I, you know, so that's, ram I'm rambling there, but it was a good question. I, hope, I think I got at it. We just got sicker and sicker of the war. Sure. Thank you. Uh, this, uh, it, this quote here it just uh, speaks, I'm going to uh, go a little faster here now, uh, talks about the property loss in the countryside. And uh, the country people are beginning to come in. They were plundered indiscriminately, horses and mules taken, houses broken open, and everything the thieves fancied stolen, which uh, Lincoln, um, you know, which Lee asked them not to do or directed them not to do, but they, of course they did it anyway. And I know Scott has done a lot of work. It's on the York County History Center's website, uh, property um, uh, requests of the government after the war is over with. So you can actually see where they stole stuff. The wages of war. Uh, this is, uh, this, we, we know this. This uh, is what happened in Gettysburg. Uh, this is Mary Fisher who went down there. No imagination could paint the picture in that wood. Uh, I instinctively recalled at the site. Here was a veteran. Civil War nurse, uh, not trained, but a veteran nurse by now, uh, you know, I instinctively recoiled from the site, you know, so she was, and then here's another nurse, another person who was Cassandra Small Morris, who was involved locally, you know, in, in at the Civil War Hospital and so forth. She said, and this is Cassandra Small writing about her aunt. You ask about Aunt Cassie. She was terrified beyond all, didn't take her clothes off at night for more than a week, sat up in a large chair, couldn't sleep at all, looked miserably, and never smiled. You know, there's no way to glorify the Civil War in anywhere, but in York County, the war came to us. We saw this. There's a woman who was probably impacted for the rest of her life. Not a young woman, but a woman who pitched in, and she was comatose. So we need to, re we need to burn these in, there, you know, this was a this was a terrible war. The results were good, but what it took, got there was was a lot of blood. Uh, we we won't again. We won't spend a lot of uh, a time on this. This is a political scene. We've talked about that, and uh, unfortunately, uh, you know, you you can't see it on the screen here, but because the, the windows are these covering it up. But your county voted with the South. Workers, your county was one of the few counties that that voted with the South. Uh, the, in other words, your county looks green on the map to the right, along with the south. And uh, Scott Mingus, thank you, Scott. This is uh, Scott's work that he did. He showed where, you know, in the 1860 election, this, where Lincoln supporters were, mainly in the upper, in the northern part of the county, and where the, uh, you know, the uh, Democrat support was, which is mainly in the uh, heavily German areas of the county. In 1864, this shows the relative vote uh, counts. We've already talked about that, so we won't dwell on this. But uh, the main thing I want to try to show here is the, the kind of the division between the soldier vote and the civilian vote. You can see the uh, civilian vote up there across your county. You can see all the numbers and so on. But you can see the soldier from all uh, your county units backed Lincoln by 680 to 389, 62% of the vote. So, you know, in your county, uh, Lincoln got 37% of the vote. Among your county units, Lincoln got 62% of the vote. So you can see that those that were in the field believed in Lincoln, those at home didn't. Imagine the conversations that took place when those young men got home, you know, or it, it didn't have to wait till they got home. There's in their letters and so on, but very interesting division to point out there. Uh, you know, uh, and this, this shows after the war, after, you know, in 1865, the war's uh, winding down, the Union has won. This shows in rural areas, just rural areas, what uh, some of the conflict was. I think all the copperheads about 
uh, about here ought to be afraid to raw for Jeff Davis now. Some of the boys of the A7th, that's a local unit, were like to have a fuss with some of the copperheads. I think they'd better keep themselves quiet. And then in Stewartstown, we have a case of uh, someone speaking against Lincoln, and he was, uh, he was egged. Uh, so, you know, uh, and, and they hit him in the mouth, they beat a hasty retreat. So again, the division, the impact of the war on York County, it was, it was a tremendous impact. Uh, some of the other things that developed, you know, during the war itself, Samuel Small uh, put together, developed the York Benevolent Association, which is still with us. It still is helping the poor. And he saw a need uh, because the war was hurting the poor people, many of the poor people in, in York disproportionately. And uh, so he, he started this York Benevolent Association and, uh, you know, still in operation here. But there is, of course, as we talked about, the Children's from York, which is also still in operation, which is also inspired by the small, Sam Small and Isabel Small, and uh, was chartered right after the war. This is an interesting slide here, um, you know, that in 1875, 10 years after the war, th there remain in the school at, at present 57 children, 31 of them being soldiers, orphans. So 10 years after the war, we still have this type of impact from the war on young people, children in York County. Terrible war, terrible war. Okay, uh, good, some good can come from the bad, uh, of course. Uh, and some of that good was that the military hospital did pave the way for York Hospital. I don't, no one has, uh, I, I think there's a master's thesis waiting to be written on this topic, you know, the connection between, and Scott, maybe when you write your, your book on the military hospital, you can extend it to York Hospital, but there's a lot of overlap in the physicians. So, so these uh, surgeons, these physicians from the military hospital trained up, became proficient, and they were leaders in York Hospital. And Samuel Small was a leader in New York Hospital. He was a leader in the military hospital or a leader in town during the military hospital. So there, there's, I think there's a connection there. Uh, someone would need to just prove it out, but uh, a lot of overlap. So that's a good thing uh, if we can point that went there. The, here's a case of disabilities. You know, we had 700 wounded that have been documented, but here's, here's just one of the disabilities it involved, uh, uh, you know, John Jameson. And he put in, um, you know, when he was seeking pension afterwards, uh, it, it said in the pension report, he was not put on duty, his face and head did not seem right. You know, so here we have a lot of troops went away to war and were affected by disease and they were affected, exposed to different types of illnesses they hadn't connected with before. And uh, so there's a lot of people that were, that were ill and never really gained their strength after the war. And here's, here's an example of that. Uh, the war got uh, York and York County ready for the Industrial Revolution. June Lloyd said that a little bit earlier. We know that Gladfelder Paper, S. Morgan Smith, uh, you know, the turbine maker and York Manufacturing, the refrigeration, all came up in the 1870s. Well, Gladfelder was in the 1860s, but, uh, but they, they, they came up, in, uh, you know, after the war. And uh, it's, it's interesting, you can see, um, the, the tall tower building in the photo, that's York City Market. Our market houses started going up. The, this city market went up in 1878, which was 13 years after the war was over with. So our agriculture obviously rebounded. We had five covered market sheds in the late 1800s. Agriculture was mighty. Our industries were, were um, mighty. Uh, those red brick buildings that we see around York today went up, many of them went up uh, after the Civil War in the Industrial Revolution. An interesting thing, the census was just an interesting thing to look at. Uh, in in the, the decade between 1860 and 1870, the growth was the lowest, except for a couple uh, odd moments. One was not the, and you can see 1910 to 1920, uh, the growth was only 5.9%. And that of course was because of World War I and the Spanish flu, you know, uh, really cut down on population growth. We lost a lot of people. And then, of course, the Depression was a difficult moment between 1930 and 1940. But you can see that in, uh, during the Civil War uh, from uh, 1860 to 1870, we only grew 11.6%. Uh, and that's, so, you know, it, it, it did impact the growth of the county. The other historic numbers are obviously higher than that in that time frame. 
uh, you know, um, you know, there's a good thing happened after the war in that the the in the Grand Army of the Republic post started and the veterans came back and they they did group together. They grouped together in these the GARs. Uh, in your you know, there was 13 white posts and uh, and uh, Stephen H. Smith has written about the David E. Small post. It was a black post, uh, black soldiers who who fought in the war and they would have encampments and Memorial Day ceremonies. And so it was a time for the, the, uh, the veterans to gain support from each other and to try to recover mentally and in every way after the war. It was a time that brothers really came together. It, and it's interesting, but it does show a division here that Stephen writes about. He wrote, you can see there, post uh, 37 and post uh, 369, the white and the black uh, post marched as a group from downtown York to Prospect Hill Cemetery in North York. From there, members of the post 369 proceeded farther up the hill to, to, uh, to Lebanon Cemetery in North York, which is a historically black cemetery. So you can see that they were together for a while. They went as far as together as Prospect Hill Cemetery, and then they segregated out, uh, you know, to the respective cemeteries. So even at a time of coming together of the veterans, we were coming apart as, as veterans. And, uh, you know, we, we have here a, just a, a very interesting uh, uh, John Aquila Wilson here. Uh, you know, he's the gentleman at the right in the picture on the left. And uh, he was a black soldier who uh, fought, fought in U.S. Uh, colored troops. And his granddaughter said years later, he wanted uh, black people to be able to own property and vote. He won the same rights as everyone else, she said. And so he was one of the longest lived veterans, but you can see that he's here enjoying being a veteran. You know, there's, there's fraternity there for him. There's a coming together for him. Um, and uh, so it, it's a moment after the war, in many ways, a good moment when the veterans could, could uh, really uh, feed off each other in a good way. Uh, you know, coming to the end here, and uh, you know, uh, the York's honor was challenged, and it was challenged. Uh, criticism of the surrender came quickly, but bled into silence in the 20th century. And so you can see that the you know the critique, the response, these from the Harrisburg Telegraph. This came right after uh, the surrender. If Early's name had been omitted, his address could not have been distinguished from any of the editorial paragraphs with which the York Gazette is weekly laden. So immediately that decision came under attack. And uh, you know, you see the York Gazette, which was a democratic paper, the David Small was part of the surrender deal. He also owned the paper. So he, he went and defended the decision. And then we have uh, James Latimer says, I, I, don't, I do not believe such large requisitions would have been made had not the borough authorities behaved so sheepishly in regard to the surrender. So we were soft, James Latimer saying we were soft, we surrendered. They, Juba Early came in and they requisitioned all the more and, and stole all the more because he knew we weren't gonna resist in any way. So, you know, this, th that, this uh, controversy involving the surrender started immediately and it's still with us today. I think it's good that we are discussing it because as I said earlier, for much of the 1900s, we didn't, we didn't talk about that. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. I think this is really the, uh, the key moment, I've shown this before, and this was in, in 1988, 125th anniversary, where we had a reenactment of the surrender. We had a last laugh about it, and, uh, you know, or at least try to make sense of it. And uh, the Juba Early character came uh, up to the mayor and, uh, you know, and, and demanded a surrender, and Bill Aldhouse, the mayor at the time, says, we are no longer unprotected, having the finest police force uh, a police department in the country, with all due respect, General uh, Early, no. And uh, so, you know, uh, you know, after that, I think that's a breaking point. After that, the York uh, Civil War Roundtable uh, started meeting uh, later, about uh, 10 years later. Uh, you know, we had the Goodrich book. It was written by uh, Dr. Drzewski. Uh, and then we had uh, Scott Mingus, this is Tsunami that um, has helped us understand the Civil War in many, many ways. Um, you know, so I wanna, maybe we'll pause for a second here and then I'll, I'll just kind of uh, uh, conclude at, 
Adam, are there any questions um, at this point? Uh, we do not have any accumulated so far, but okay. if people have any, this would be a great time. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'll go ahead and just uh, go along, and if you get some, let me know. Uh, it's, this is really, this is the way that it was seen then, and this is the way that we see it now, because I'm sure there are some of the folks that are on this, um, this, this uh, webinar right now, they would side, they're probably wondering what the big deal about the surrender was. They would side with, um, you know, not the 1980 conversation here, that uh, York sustained, after all, York sustained no loss of life and little property damage. York did what York does best. York treated the Civil War as a commercial enterprise. York did not want the city burned, so that city business leaders asked, what can we do to avoid that? And came up with uh, the transaction of a surrender. Then we have Mark Snell and, and others. Uh, I would hold to this view uh, that uh, Jew Burley was bluffing and they fell for it. He would not have set fire to that town. And so he, he kind of, we kind of fell for his bluff. We know Juba early now. We know Juba early uh, couldn't have done it or wouldn't have done it uh, because he was under orders uh, from Lee not to. So you still need to hear these conversations that is still to take place. And, and again, there's, that's good. We're talking about the war. We need to talk about this. Uh, so I, I want to uh, just kind of close by a couple things here. What's the use of this? Why do we talk about all this? you know, how do we make sense of this? And so I have several points here. I'll just run down pretty, pretty quickly. Uh, you know, do we see, a, if we see a problem that demands a stand, do, do we do what they did, in, uh, what the town's fathers did in the Civil War and just do what works instead of what might be in principle? And pr the principle thing might have been to, to try to hold off the Confederates in whatever way we could, or at least stand in the square and uh, uh, passive aggressively, uh, you know, you know, uh, take them on, um, you know, with words, uh, because they, we were so badly outnumbered. The, you know, what we did is the pragmatic thing was we went out and met them because we thought that we could cut a deal. And uh, when you do that, you give away, as we saw, you give away some of your honor. And how does that affect the way we think about things today? So we can talk about that, you know, if you want in the Q&A. Our decisions can shape uh, where we live for generations. You think for a second, what if, what if we had had a, a different view? What if we had not surrendered? What if we not sought them out, uh, the Confederates out? What a, you know, how many towns could have an American Revolution history as we do, a World War II history as we do, and a Civil War history as we would have? You know, I would submit that we still have an outstanding Civil War history we just went over the bravery. We just spent the last 45 minutes going over all the way that the, that the town dealt with this and supported the war and the soldiers support. We have a, a good story to tell, but that surrender has gotten in the way of, of us telling that story. And, uh, you know, we should be proud of the Civil War in many ways. And, uh, and, and so and I'm talking about the York area here. Uh, and I think by not, by not being proud of the Civil War, we haven't talked about, you know, in, especially in the 20th century, we didn't probe issues leading to the war, race and racism, discrimination. There's kind of a, a silence. George Sheets, who was a, just recently passed away, historian, uh, wrote a 1980, early 80s uh, general history of York County. And he said one of the things that he was urged not to do by the town's father was, was to write about the surrender of York. Not to write, so he did anyway. But we didn't have, we didn't really deal with, embrace the Civil War in the, in the 20th century. As I said, we have, we've gained our footing now, we're doing that. Um, and that's, that's to our benefit as a community. Then uh, I think that uh, a couple more points. Authenticity is important. And, uh, and we should strive to have our, 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 our county's historical narrative based on truth and guard against introduction of myth. We shouldn't try to spin or revise what's really happening in our past or invent the reputations of those on the wrong side. Here we have, you know, the newspaper clipping to the right was written by, um, by a historian, and he basically says that uh, David Small was an unsung hero. David Small, the mayor of town, the, 
the operator of the newspaper at that time was an unsung hero. The thing, the problem with that is even in David Small's obituary, it doesn't try to paint him as a hero. It, 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 if anything, it, it kind of makes excuses for his, his part in the decision to surrender the town. So here we reach back and say he's a hero whenever even contemporaries didn't feel that way. Uh, so that's just one example of that. We should own the fact that we were politically soft in our support of Abraham Lincoln's war efforts. We compromised in not standing against slavery, what President U.S. Grant called a stain on a democracy. We just need to own that. We didn't take a strong stand. We, we kind of were against the war that would have freed the slaves, probably for economic reasons, as we saw. But let's learn from our history and vow that we'll never again compromise in our opposition uh, to causes or movements undergirded by racism. So that's the last point. I have one more slide, but I, I, I hopefully that evokes some questions. If it didn't, we'll just wrap up here. Um, thank you very much, Jim. Uh, there is a comment from Bill Landis from Kentucky. He says hello to you and to Scott. Um, okay. And uh, it's just a comment, really, but he's saying he oh, likes yeah. June, June Lloyd's analysis of an industrialization in York County. Uh, I'm not yeah. sure that she's with us tonight, but uh, we'll make sure that she knows about that. Yeah. Um, I okay. actually, do, Go ahead. I actually Go ahead. do have a question if I could. Uh, oh, um, you know what? If I could, there is a question, but I, I wondered if I could go back to that. Um, that the, the uh, article from Carl Hatch that you had up on that slide, yes. it's right there. Okay. Um, so I, I just, I just kind of squinted there. I haven't read the full thing, but it, he's talking about David E, but he's saying he's the owner of the York Gazette. So did he just get confused? Yes. Uh, throughout history, we've been confused um, okay. between the two. You can see how easy it would be. He, he was just wrong. Okay. And, uh, I, I would have to tell you that uh, back in 1993, I got the two confused. I, I used David E. rather than David myself. So I, I shouldn't have said that because uh, we should let that be lost to history. I got everything else right, but I, <laughs> I, I, I got too confused. So I, I'm not going to point a finger at him, but I, that's the last time that'll happen. So, so easy to do. Um, but, but his general point is in defense of, of the Democrat, David Small. Is that yes. correct? Okay. Correct. I, right. And I'm not, I guess I am trying to insinuate, but I just noticed that the date of this was July 9th, 1969, uh, which is an interesting year in York County history. So I don't know if we can extrapolate anything from this or not, but. The, uh, the, the ride started later, if that's July 3rd, started later, so. Oh, 3rd, I, I can't read, sorry. It, what, what he, it started two weeks later. What he was doing, right. that, was in, that was in conjunction with the anniversary of the invasion of the Confederates. Right. That, that's what I get it. Yeah. Yeah. I, I would say sure. David, David Small, uh, David Small was what, even in his obituary, it says that he was a, a common sense person that wanted to, to make things work. That wasn't, he wasn't ever going to rise in politics. He was a solid person. And so probably what he did was try to, make the best of what happened after Farker went and cut that preliminary deal and, uh, you know, and tried to make sense of it with the rest of the Committee of Safety. He wouldn't have, um, he wouldn't have had great thoughts. So he wouldn't have gone outside his lane and said, well, we ought to resist. That wouldn't have been in his nature. It wasn't his pol politics anyway. Right. Uh, uh, but, but he was, so he wasn't an innovator. But nine terms as mayor, he obviously had some capabilities. And uh, so he also was on the wrong, shall we say, on the wrong side of history. All right, thank you. Uh, there is a question. Um, did York's congressman vote for the 13th Amendment? I don't, I don't know the answer to that. Scott uh, Mingus, do you know? Yep, I just, uh, Adam Glassbrenner uh, was one of the Many Democrats have voted nay. Yeah. Uh, an interesting point of this is Adam Glossbrenner was part owner of the paper with uh, David Small in the early 1860s, if not the 18, 
1950s. So he gave that up uh, whenever he got into higher political office. Adam, Glo Adam Glossbrenner also uh, is, we should all know him anyway, because he was one of the co-authors of the first history in York County, uh, Carter and Glossbrenner's, or is it Glossbrenner and Carter? Carter and Glossbrenner's uh, history of uh, York County in the 1830s, I believe. So he was, a, uh, you know, he, he was involved in civic life here, uh, but an ardent Democrat, ardent peace Democrat. And uh, he, so he was influential in, in the York Gazette and also influential with David Small. Okay, I'll go ahead and close here. And uh, I, I just want to just point out two different paths here. This is the last slide. And again, uh, using uh, a quote from uh, uh, Scott Mangus, um, two different paths. Um, we have bravery under fire in Wrightsville. And this is just a, this is one of my all time favorite York County stories that Scott was able to get. He, you know, uh, Scott Mangus was able to get. And as the Confederates were rushing the bridge, you know, we have, um, you know, this account of uh, one old Negro to whom we was entrusted the duty of igniting the fuse sat very coolly on the edge of the pier, smoking a cigar. So as the Confederates were rushing the bridge, the bridge was mined so that when they lit the fuses, it would blow down a span. A span would fall into the water and the Confederate, they would keep the, the most of the bridge, it would just use that one span. And uh, so he was there with his cigar ready to light the fuses. That mining didn't work as we know, and later the bridge uh, was burned to keep to stop the advance. Uh, but here we have this, um, uh, you know, I think his name was Jacob Miller. I'm, I'm pretty sure about that, Scott. And uh, uh, Jacob Miller, the um, this black man, who if he'd been if he had been uh, captured, what would have happened to him? Here he was entrusted with the duty of a night in the fuse, very coolly sitting there, ready to take on. You have this image of this this uh, old man ready to take on uh, uh, Gordon's best rushing the bridge. So there's one image. And then we have the other image uh, about A.B. Farquhar going in the opposite direction to surrender, to cut a deal to surrender the town. The, the, this happened the day before Jacob Miller was, was at the bridge, happened the day before. We have A.B. Farquhar alone and without authority to speak for the council. He rode off to Abbottstown in the early afternoon. So we have Farquhar going that way to surrender the town, we have um, Jacob Miller sitting on the bridge, ready to blow, uh, blow up the bridge um, and risking his life and taking on the Confederates with, a, with, with his cigar as his weapon. You know, and we have A.B. Farquhar going to cut a deal. So, and A.B. Farquhar is not debating it. He says, my plan, however, was not seriously entertained. Then I told them I would I take the responsibility of going anyhow, which I did. You know, he was telling the city's fathers, David Small and the other city's fathers, you know, hey, let me go and uh, kind of deal. I know these guys. And they said, ah, ah. this is earlier in the day on Saturday when the uh, Confederates were approaching the Abbottstown area. <laughs> and they go, nah. So then I told them I was take the responsibility of going any way, anyhow, which I did. So see, think about those images there. That talks about the, Im that talks about the types of things we've been talking about all evening here. You know, two different paths. One going west to meet the army, one sitting there coolly to try to stop the Confederate army. And that was, that's your county at that time, a very confused time, a very troubling, pro troubling time, a time that we're still trying to figure out. So thank you very much. I really appreciate uh, being here and uh, having the opportunity to speak tonight. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jim. And uh, thank you, Scott, for your uh, comments. Um, both of you have immense expertise on this subject. Um, I don't think we have any additional questions, but uh, I think your conclusion there, Jim, really has helped distill out, um, like you said, confusing. I think that's the best way. And history is a very messy thing. I think we like to think that history is straightforward, but it's not. Um, and I think we're living through a very confusing time as well, so maybe this can help us understand that our current time is by no way, in, in no way unique. Yeah, Adam, if I could just uh, say, uh, you know, there's been in this uh, coronavirus uh, uh, pandemic, 
uh, there's been some really interesting work being done by the uh, county commissioners uh, and the Economic Alliance, uh, which I think is directly at play here, because we're, we're here we are in this pandemic and we have, we need a plan. You know, we need an assessment. We need to take it head on. What worked, what didn't work. And that happened. You know, there was a task force uh, led by the economic, uh, well, uh, Silas Chamberlain from the Economic Alliance and, and uh, pulled together uh, people. They looked at everything, what worked, what didn't work. And, and they put forth this very bold idea of a county health department, countywide health department, which is in your county terms, that's aggressive. You know? And so there's none of this, well, the, the slaves are down there, you know, you know, you know, it's not our problem, you know. You know, it, there's an example where we're taking it head on. And uh, I don't think we took it head on in the Civil War. And, um, and maybe somewhere someone is looking at that, uh, our, our leaders today are looking at that and said, look, you know, we need to, to we, we have a problem, let's look at it. Let's, let's, don't, let's, let's own it, let's own it. And I think that's a modern day example where we might have learned from, from the Civil War. Well, that's wonderful and a great way to sum things up. All right. Um, I guess I'll turn it over to Nicole, who's in the background. But uh, thank you all very much for coming tonight. And we're looking forward to doing this again in a month um, in mid-July. And we'll be announcing details uh, in the next few weeks about uh, what we'll be doing. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you, Jim and Scott, and thank you, everyone.